Good afternoon again. I know that we're not all finished eating, but we're going to go ahead and start today's program. Uh, before we do that, uh, that was a fantastic meal. Uh, thank you so much to our servers, to the folks who prepared that meal, to the wonderful people who chose it off of the menu, and to the site selection committee who chose Providence as the location for the 2022 Technical Symposium before the pandemic and gave us such a generous budget. <clears throat> so, uh, this is the first timers lunch and the tradition at the tech Technical Symposium has been for a long time to have the presentation at this luncheon given by the winner of the SIGSI Lifetime Service Award. The winner this year is uh, well known to the old timers in the room. He goes by a uh, single name, Simon, and he's made all kinds of contributions to the community over decades. Unfortunately, he is unable to travel to the symposium. So we're doing something a little bit different this year and I get the pleasure of introducing two longtime and dear friends who have also been leaders in the 60 community, not quite as long as Simon, but uh, we'll get there. And uh, so there's a program that got started in 2016. It's funded by the NSF. It's the DEERS program, which if I remember correctly is Designing Empirical Education Research Studies. They somehow left out the word computing, but we all know that it's in there implicitly. Uh, and they have done that every summer since 2016, sometimes virtually, but they bring in new or sometimes slightly experienced computing education researchers and they teach them how to do it right. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce my good friends Sarah Heckman and Mark Sheriff. Thank you, Larry, and welcome again to the 2022 SIGSI Technical Symposium. My name is Mark Sheriff. I'm Sarah Heckman. And as he said, this is a little bit different. One thing that we are going to point out is that Sarah and I have worked together for two plus decades. And so uh, this is going to be a little bit more informal and there's a very good chance we'll interrupt each other <laughs> and finish each other the sentences. Don't worry, it's completely okay. And as Larry said, this is usually given by the, life, the uh, service award winner. And so we have to once again recognize Simon. The, yeah, let's go ahead. Simon, if you want, yeah. Simon, if you are watching, thank you for everything that you have done for the SIGC community, particularly all of your work with the ITIC conference. Um, I went to go find a picture of Simon, and it turns out that the University of Newcastle, in their special collections library of digital images, had multiple pictures of Simon over the years. And I just loved this picture. I thought it captured a great joy. And so I wanted to share it with you. And hopefully he's OK with sharing this one. It was in the library, so I guess, I guess it was probably OK. So anyway, this is probably the first time for a lot of people here in 2022. But I bet we have some first timers who would have been first timers in 2020 or 2021. So by sh stand up, clap, st let's, let's do stand up. You're eating your bread. You're eat we had a nice meal. Have a moment to stand up. If you are going to be a first timer in 2020, welcome, welcome. We're finally here. If you are going to be a first timer in 2021, or you were a first timer in 2021 virtually, yes. And now our first timers for 2022. Look at this. This is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. One thing that 
Sarah and I have seen over the years, and others uh, in this room who have been to a number of SIGCs will attest to, is just how much this community has grown. And it's very exciting, and it's, it's, it's awesome. But we also need to recognize the other folks in the room, the returning champions. If you are a returning champion here to answer questions, go ahead and identify yourself, please. There we go. Thank you, folks, you can answer, ask questions of. So, it's been an interesting few years for the Technical Symposium, is kind of an understatement. Uh, this is how Sarah and I spent uh, 2020, uh, there with Pam and Alvaro. What can you do? <laughs> we were there, and this was the, uh, the morning, the Thursday morning. The, our, our speaker at the time, Juan Gilbert, was ready to go on. We got the call, and so we just took a picture outside the exhibit hall, just, eh? And then, of course, the second picture there, that's my desk during the, uh, the production of SIGC 2021. I probably should have removed some of the video game controllers, but regardless, <laughs> that is where a lot of the magic happened from, from 2021. And when we thought about the opportunity that Maureen and, and Larry gave us to give this talk, where the, the service award winner comes and talks about their experiences in the community and, and how things have changed and, and that sort of thing, which is fantastic. We recognize that we haven't been here as long as some of the folks here, but what we can talk about is what did we want to know? when we were a first timer. When we showed up to our very first 60, mine was Portland, not 2020, was Portland 2008. That was my first one. When was your first one? Uh, 2009 and Chattanooga. 2009 Chattanooga. We had questions and we came to the first timer lunch and sometimes they were answered, sometimes they weren't. And a lot of times it was about just what was going on at the technical symposium. But the biggest question that we had was just, what is SIGC? What is this? Now, Adrian talked about this in the plenary, if you were able to, to, to be here for that. And Adrian, you have absolutely permission to yell at me if I get something wrong now, um, then correct me to make sure we get it right. But the one thing that's very important to remember is that SIGC is not this. Sheriff, what are you talking about? Well, I signed up for, I paid 150 bucks to be here. Uh, this is SIGC. No, 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 no. This is the technical symposium. And it's important to differentiate the fact that SIGC is one of the special interest groups under ACM. And it does a lot more than just the technical symposium. In fact, if you look at the membership of, of SIGC as an organization, we're approaching 3,000 members across 63 different countries, multiple conferences, all the things that Adrian talked about during the plenary this morning, the, the travel grant. Are there travel grant award winners here, travel grant awards? Fantastic, fantastic. And it's so important for our community to keep supporting those. The special project grants, the one that always pops in my mind is the CSED podcast by Kristen Stevens Martinez. Our hybrid chair has a podcast about CS education. Go figure. You should go listen to it. There are the four conferences. ICER coming up. ICER just tweeted like 20 minutes ago. They announced their keynote speaker. Make sure you're, you're, you are getting your papers ready for, for that in uh, Lugano. IDACI, our European-based conference, and then CompEd. I've been challenged multiple times now. That is the CompEd logo that I found on the, on the SIGC org website. So I apologize to CompEd if there's another logo I'm missing. But the point is, is that it is a bigger community than just, just that. All right, so we understand that your first time at the Technical Symposium can be a bit overwhelming. If you looked at how thick that program book is, and you should see the effort that um, the chairs put into putting it together, it's fantastic, and it changed a few times, and that's okay too. But this is a big conference in a big community, um, but also a lot of fun. This is my home conference. So there's lots of different activities and ways to get involved while you're here on site or online. So please make sure you're checking out these sessions and engaging with the community. So we have our standard uh, plenaries and technical sessions with our papers, but I wanted to highlight some of the other ways to engage with the conference. So some really fun things to attend are our panels and our special sessions. 
And one of the reasons I recommend these is because they only happen here or online, which means some <laughs> of them might be recorded, so maybe it won't completely stay in Providence. But those are things you can't go back and check the proceedings for a paper to give you all of the information. You should also definitely check out our supporter sessions. Our supporters have been so generous mm -hmm. to us as a, a technical symposium with um, you know, providing just really the financial support to keep this affordable so we can all be here and uh, to help with things like you know, supporting the online, uh, everything like that. And so you should go to the exhibits hall, go say hi to our supporters, and you might find something new and interesting to take home to support your uh, computing education challenges. Now, the other session I want to highlight is birds of a feather. So this you may not have seen at other types of conferences. They only happen Thursday nights. There's only two parallel sessions, but they are a more informal way to bring people together around a topic of interest. Now, my favorite uh, birds of a feather is the teaching track one, uh, which I attended in my very first SIGSI and has led to numerous professional and personal connections that have uh, helped actually lead to being here today. Oh, there are other ways to get involved. We have our demos, our posters, and our lightning talks where you can see new and emerging uh, areas of interest, uh, some new research areas, some uh, really cool things that people have been trying. And we also have nifty assignments. So if you need inspiration for that next great assignment to inspire your class, you should go check it out. They are well nifty. And finally, for those who are new to conferences, you really want to engage in what we call the hallway track. Not everything happens in a conference room. Some of the best conversations and interactions you'll have are in the hallway. Uh, so at my second technical symposium, I ran into someone who was going to be a future chair. We started chatting, wondering if we were meeting each other for lunch. We weren't. Um, but we were able to have a nice conversation. And when she asked where I was from, and I said, NC State, she said, the technical symposium is going to be there in uh, 2012. You want to do local arrangements? Here I am. So a great way <laughs> and, to and get And you involved. haven't left. I haven't. Because I haven't you, we much. keep calling you back because you do awesome. Exactly. So it's a great way to get involved uh, in the community. So take advantage of that hallway track. Come say hi. I'm going to be at the registration desk, so please stop by and say hello. So let's dig a little bit more into the paper portion of the technical symposium, because we've actually been seeing some changes uh, in this over the last few years. So in 2018, uh, Tiffany Barnes and Dan Garcia proposed the creation of paper tracks for the technical symposium. And then they were actually put into place with Beth Hawthorne and Manuel Perez Guiones in 2019. And it's a great way of really showcasing the different types of scholarship that comes out of the computing education community. So we have our computing education research, our experience reports and tools, and our position in curricula initiative papers. And as a former program chair, I did want to take a little bit of time to discuss what these different tracks mean. And I challenge you, as you're attending sessions today, to try to figure out, is that a research paper? Is that an experience report? Or is it a curriculum or position paper? Now, you get the freebies with all the best papers, because they're marked. But the rest of the program, it's up to you to figure out. So let's dig into this a little bit. So computing education research papers will have a research question, or multiple, or hypotheses, or something that they're trying to answer through a set of methods and data that are collected, typically about a community of interest like a classroom. And we want to be able to have the appropriate methods to evaluate and respond to that particular research question or hypothesis. And the results will uh, seek to answer it. And these research questions should be supported and, and really put the, the sort of scope around the work through high quality limitations uh, enlisting those there. With research studies, those are typically planned up front as opposed to maybe a post hoc analysis of something. And we really, really want to encourage replication of existing studies as well as the reporting of null and negative results. And if you're like, what are null and negative results? Well, let's think of it this way. You did something and nothing changed. That's a null result. Or you did something, it didn't work. That's a negative result. Now, the research papers and the experience reports can be a little confusing about which track do you submit a paper to. And so let's try to dig into this difference a little bit as we go through our experience reports. So experience reports don't answer a research question, typically. And they provide a deep reflection 
and detail so someone can take that into their own environment or context. So the idea here is that experience reports tend to be more for the practitioners than the researchers. Now there are some variations of this. We can also talk about teaching techniques. You, share, you try something new in your classroom, you wanna share what happened and see if other people want to adopt it. Those are great uh, to include in this track as well. And tools papers where you're talking about the tool and its use. Now if you're re researching to see if the tool is actually doing what it's supposed to do and measuring what it's supposed to measure or whatever the tool is supposed to do, that's a research paper. So hopefully that clarifies some of the differences between these. Now our third track is the position and curricula initiatives. And so our position papers are there to encourage academic conversation around topics of interest. And so they typically have some type of premise and support from the literature about that premise and are a really great way to start conversations about new and interesting ideas and directions that our community should consider. And we also have our curricula initiative papers. These describe our new and revised curricula. Um, programs, degree programs that might be created, uh, all sorts of different things like that. It can even be to the point of like professional development for K-12 teachers, really anything that's show showcasing how you might teach a subject, organize it, even potentially the funding structure, all sorts of things. So as we're seeing, um, you know, states and countries take on computing as a fundamental thing that our students need to know, I think we'll start seeing a lot more of these curricula um, papers because people want to share. How did I actually do this in my context? So, three different paper tracks, encourage you to consider them. So back in 2014, after we had been going to SIGC Technical Symposium for a while and been engaging in the computing education research community, Sarah and I are both software engineering in our background, doing software engineering research. And so we were very interested in the state of reporting in computer science education research. Not necessarily, well not even necessarily, not looking at, was this a good study? Hmm, what do you think? No, 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 no. We're not making those calls. This is how well were our authors publishing the results in such a way that it could be replicated at other institutions. We all recognize that if we do a project at University of Virginia, R1 University, Southern United States, North Carolina State, R1 University, Southern United States. There's a lot of similarity there. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work at, you know, University of Rhode Island or wherever you're from, a smaller school, a community college. It's great to show that something worked or didn't work. Null and negative hypotheses, uh, null and negative results are important. They are important. Wouldn't you like to know? Hey, this sounds great. Oh, look, this paper says I'm gonna go into my room and my students will hate me. Awesome, I should know that before I try this. Um, it's important to publish those as well, but we need to know how it works in other areas. So what we decided to do was create a rubric. And what this rubric was built around was how well are authors reporting their study. It includes everything from the research question, the study design, the results, the related work, threats to validity, all of these things, and we rated them. We did every paper from the Technical Symposium, ITSE, ICER, TOSI, CSE, the last two being two journals, in addition to those three conferences, CompEd had not come online yet, for uh, 2014 and 2015. Looked at all of them. And we are now currently going through 2019 and 2020, so the five year move forward, and we published it in TOSI. Uh, the final version came out this March. So what we would like to share with you is a little bit of, well, what did we think we would find? What was it gonna look like? How were we doing as a community in 14, 15? And we're really looking forward to see how things change over the next five years. So here is, I'm, I'm gonna do a few charts. I'm sorry, just a few charts, because I wanna show a few of the numbers. But this is how much, how many of the papers had some form of, a, of empirical evaluation? It wasn't just, you know, hypothesizing straight up theory. We actually found, you know, and uh, admittedly, our definition of empirical here was a bit broad, but, Pretty good, pretty good. Most of our papers had some sort of, uh, of evaluation by observation that uh, would lead to further replication or theory building. Okay, good. This is the subject area, the, 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 the research subject that was being investigated. Now you might not necessarily think about each of these different types of papers, but here's the way we initially broke it down. An assignment, 
I don't think I need to define what an assignment is to this room. Um, community. So the community is we are trying to establish what is the current state of belief of a community. So it might be something like, how do teaching assistants believe their beliefs about education impact their teaching or something like that? Not necessarily a, uh, something, an assignment or something you run in class, more you know, survey based. There is curriculum, again, which would be the interconnection of learning objectives, pedagogical technique, and then a tool. So something like, we are testing, does Alice work? Does Blue Jay work? The actual tool itself, not necessarily a pedagogical technique behind that tool. And what we did find is that across these venues, we see most research in pedagogical techniques. But there's a representation in all of these categories. So if you are thinking of something, and, and maybe you have an assignment, just straight up, I have an assignment on how to teach loops, picking something. And you think it's really interesting, special, whatever, and you want to perform empirical evaluation on it, there is a place for it. And you can see from these numbers that we do see more of that type, an assignment, I mean the numbers are small in this instance, but there is more of that at the technical symposium than perhaps at TOSI, and that kind of lends itself to the technical symposium being a more practitioner-based um, conference as well as a research-based conference. Now you might also say, well I have this cool idea and I'm gonna go back to my classroom, but I don't have many students. I can't do a huge study like they could do at North Carolina State or Florida or Duke or North, you know, a larger school. Well, look, this is the breakdown on the number of participants participants could be individual students, it could be data points, but the number of participants by venue for each of these papers that we saw, and you can see we do have low-end papers. Don't let you being at a school or in a classroom that you think is too small hinder you from doing an investigation. I promise you there is a place for it. Now, the big takeaway from the end of this journal paper was, well, how good are we doing? How are we as a community at producing papers that make it so that we could replicate a study? For each of these categories, we rated that uh, the item as either strong, weak, or not present. Not present, wasn't there. That one's obvious. Strong, it was clear, it was marked, it was, had its own section, it was easy to find, it was parsable, you could understand it. It was, you know, you could actually take it and immediately translate it. Weak is this kind of interesting wishy-washy category. It's, well, we found a research question, but it was kind of buried in a paragraph, and we think this is what they're trying to do, so maybe this is... It was one of those. As you can see here, in the area of related work, we have been programmed as, as researchers. We better make sure we write down all the papers where we found stuff. If we don't have a good related work section, there's gonna be a problem. Uh, reviewers are, have, have gotten that worked into people. That's, that's a good thing, right? Research question, we can find that in most things. You can see kind of the difference here too in the technical symposium versus ICER, our you know, research focused conference, the percentage goes much higher. That, shouldn't be too much of a, of, a, of a shock. The one that got us, though, was this one. <laughs> Threats to validity or limitations, however you want to say it. Those are really low numbers or high numbers in the, in the, in the not present category. Sarah, why is it so important as a program chair, why is it so important for people to make sure they talk about their threats to validity? Exactly, we wanna make sure that we understand the scope of the research. Uh, one research paper is not going to solve all of the computing education problems that we ever have had or ever will have. And so we want to understand what exactly limits your study and to the particular scope in your institutional context. Or the things that might have gone slightly wrong because with empirical research, and in particular human subject research, things do go wrong. Our classrooms as laboratories have all sorts of craziness happening in them, and we wanna make sure that that's recorded and understood so we can know how far to take the results and then how we can translate that into our own context. But now that we've gone through these ideas and reviewed the ideas behind the technical symposium, the ways to get involved, let's talk about how you 
hopefully as our first timers. Some of you are here presenting papers, but how can you get involved in the next technical symposium? So, SIGC 2020, or technical symposium Team 2023 <laughs> is coming up faster than you think. Uh, you'll have the lovely call for papers on the blue sheet inside the bag that you got at registration, and you'll see that the abstract deadline and the uh, full paper deadline are in mid-August, so early to mid-August. Then the deadline for um, the other set of items, uh, like the, the demos and the boss and those types of things, those are October 14th. I remember that one is my birthday. So, <laughs> happy birthday to me. Okay. Are you going to so, get something in for your birthday? Uh, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. That's the goal, that's the goal. All right, so we want you to get involved and engaged in the, the conference or in the technical symposium. And so we think that when you are done with the event here, you are going to leave super excited about lots of things. And if you go home with fewer than five ideas that you want to do from um, the symposium, well, we might have failed in putting together things, but I don't think that'll be a problem at all. In fact, the problem is going to be, you're gonna to wanna to do so much, you have to figure out what to do first and how to scale it down. Because you can't do everything at once, I know I've tried, um, and that's not going to uh, be the best idea, at least to you know, keep you sane. So we want you to think about these ideas that you have and how you can take them, how you can make a plan, and then how you can go and um, contribute something to the Technical Symposium for 2023 or in future years. Now, the reason we suggest this is because if you are doing human subjects research, that does usually require some type of ethics approval, and the US is your uh, Institutional Review Board, or IRB, which means you should probably be thinking about that now mm -hmm. uh, for papers that are going to be written and submitted in August. Now, that will take you a bit of time, but that's a great thing to get started with. We also encourage that if you're going to run a study, that you create a pilot and you get feedback from trusted colleagues on that particular pilot before you actually go and run it in your classroom. You can fix so many potential problems that come up. Uh, for example, having a um, question in a survey where you're missing a response, <laughs> that is really important and most of the students would fill in. I've done that, oops. <laughs> but also, you should make sure to have a good research question. So, what does make a good research question? The first thing is that it should be interesting. Is this something that would be of interest to the technical symposium or the competing education community? Um, and so, it may not be of interest to everybody, and that's okay. There's probably someone in the community that it would be of interest to, or a probably a larger group of someones than you might think. The other thing you wanna consider is that, is this question answerable? can I actually find an answer to this question? So you want to refine your research question to the point where it can be answerable. You also wanna think about repeatability and replication. So is this a research question that someone somewhere else might be interested in answering in their own context? So I hope you can sense the theme here of replication coming through. We also wanna think about is the research question measurable? Can we actually take a concrete measure of what we're working on. And then you wanna make sure it's appropriately scoped. And this is where you don't want to do everything at once, but you wanna focus on that one key thing that you can look at in your classroom or your context and be able to answer that particular research question, preferably within a you know, reasonable time frame. Education research takes a long time. If you're doing something in a classroom, you're talking scales of semesters. If you're running a baseline, you're probably talking about multiple semesters. So there are large uh, timescales potentially involved in educational research. So thinking about the appropriate scope of that question can help you refine down to something um, small and easy to accomplish. So you want to have a revise and plan cycle for your research question so you can refine it and uh, come up with a really solid study to contribute to the community. Now, we are suggesting that replications are a great way to contribute, especially if educational research is new to you. So I came from software engineering background, and so while I was doing empirical software engineering, it was a little easier to transition to empirical computing education. That may not be the case for everyone. And so starting with a replication of an existing study is a great way uh, to get started with this. Every school is different, every classroom is different, even every semester is different, even when you're the person teaching the class. 
And so we encourage you to think, can I answer that same research question in my institutional context? One of the nice things about replication is you know the methods. And if you find an interesting paper at one of the sessions, you're like, I want to do that. Go talk to the author. They might actually have the tools ready to go. They might have um, some of the programs that do the data analysis for you, and they're probably going to be really happy to share and talk about their experience. And they might have ways that they can make it a little bit better on the next run of that particular study. If you don't mind me jumping in, yeah. ju just really quick, because I think it's important to mention going and talking to the authors. Ask the returning champions in this room, first timers, this is the most welcoming academic community that you will probably find, at least in my opinion it is. And that going up to the authors and asking them, hey, what you did is awesome, can we chat and we figure out how we might be able to do that at my place too? I can guarantee you there's gonna be some excitement there because that's just the type of community this is. Exactly, so I encourage you to do that and to consider a replication as you're thinking about your next contribution to the next technical symposium. Now, there are a bunch of ways to get involved beyond publications in the Technical Symposium or scholarship through the other tracks that we have. So, there are lots of ways to get involved. First off, talk to people that you're he when you're here. You never know when you might run into that future symposium chair who gets you on the committee and starts your pathway uh, through symposium leadership. We also encourage you, please, please, please sign up to be reviewers for the Technical Symposium. Um, I'm not sure how many papers were submitted this year, but in the years I was program chair, we had over 500 paper submissions. They each require three reviews plus a meta-reviewer, and that's a lot of reviews. So we encourage you to sign up uh, and participate in the community that way. It's a great way to see um, you know, emerging research uh, and to think critically about what makes these papers um, appropriate for the community and, and what the review criteria are for our different tracks. So it's a great way to get involved. And after you review for a few years, you can become involved as by becoming an associate program chair. These are our meta reviewers, and they take the reviewer comments, they bring them together into a cohesive whole, and they make a recommendation to the program chairs for acceptance or decline of a particular submission. So this is in a really important role as part of the reviewing process for the technical symposium. Um, so once you've had the opportunity to review for a while, you will have the opportunity to consider being an associate program chair. You can also become a session chair for the Technical Symposium. It's a great way to meet people. Uh, and you also get to go to the speaker's breakfast. And uh, it's a great way to get involved. So I encourage that as well. And there's more than one way to share what mm -hmm. you're doing. It doesn't have to be a paper. You can do buffs and panels and special sessions. There's just great ways to get involved. So we also need student volunteers. So if you are a student, we do encourage you to volunteer. Uh, there is a special event for uh, student volunteers on Friday evenings, and it's a great way uh, to help out. I do want to give a shout out. Um, several of our student volunteers, I believe, are here who've been mm -hmm. helping at the registration desk. They have been fantastic. Yes, yes. they have. Yes, they have. I believe it has been bright green t-shirts this year. So if you see a volunteer, there you yep. go, hold it up. Um, if you see a volunteer, thank them for being part of the symposium and helping out in this way. And finally, you can volunteer to help organize an event like this. There's lots of different roles to take on, and usually you don't start off at you know, program chair. You work your way up uh, to those particular levels, and you learn parts of the symposium along the way. So I think I've done local arrangements. I've uh, been the student volunteer coordinator. I've done posters. I've done demos. Um, all of that before getting to program chairs. And this is a lot of fun. Um, it's a great uh, group of people who are part of the symposium leadership. And there's uh, typically an open call uh, to indicate your interest in becoming part of the organization uh, committee for the technical symposium. So I encourage you to take that opportunity. In fact, Maureen, Linkiat, Brian, stand up. These are your senior chairs for 2023. Ben Stevenson, uh, junior symposium chairs in Canada, could not join us, and I am blanking on the junior. Lena. Lena, of course. I am so sorry, Lena. <laughs> Lena Bettastelli from North Carolina State. Yay. Uh, please, these are folks that you should reach out to. They'll be at the SIG C 2023 booth on the floor uh, if you have any questions. Yes, so if you want to volunteer, talk to them. All right, we are so glad you're here.
we're all glad to be here. And we're glad that you're here in person and yes. online. Yes, but please make the uh, most of your time here, participate in the chats online, engage in the hallway track uh, with everyone here, ask questions, all of that. It's, it's important to realize that, you know, and we've all been going back through this, right? We're, we're coming back to being in person. There are still social challenges as we are learning to be back in person and what people's comfort levels are. And we, we've seen everyone already be super awesome and understanding with everyone. And so that's great, but you know, make the most time if you have to step out of your comfort zone a little bit to you know, say hi to someone and introduce yourself and become more a part of the community because in all seriousness, first timers, we are so thrilled to have you here. We are so thrilled to have you as a part of this community. We want you to stay a part of this community. We want you to join us into 2023 and beyond. Yes, so again, I'm Sarah. Come find me at the registration desk. And I'm Mark, and I will be doing the Sigsy coffee break down on the show floor. By all means, come and ask us questions as well, because we love you guys and gals. Yeah. Um, I don't know what questions you could ask about this, <laughs> but if you have questions or comments, there's a, there are mics there in the middle. Um, we are happy to answer them now, but if many of your questions are things like, so how does X work? I don't know. If it's something Where, better taken offline, by all means, ask the people at your table or um, catch us afterwards, by yeah. all means. But we will hang. I have a question, but I don't think I can find it. So. Okay. <laughs> So the question is, um, uh, could we share the slides? And uh, well, they yes. are on YouTube right now. They're in Pathable because it was a recorded uh, presentation. But I, I understand that the deck itself would probably be more helpful. We'll, we will, not a problem. We can make that available. Yep, absolutely. We'll, we can add it to the Files tab in Pathable. Look at that, using Pathable. I know. Yeah, leave it to the 2021 chair to do that. Any other questions? Everyone's leaving. I feel like it's the end of class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Enjoy the symposium. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you. Yeah. Remember, you have homework due in two weeks. Oh, okay. <laughs>